HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is made possible thanks to listeners like you. Want to support independent food radio? Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate today. What's up, summer babes? Last week, my partner and I moved to Philly, where it has been hot as heck every day. We're lifting lots of heavy things and sweating nonstop and trying to make it a little bit more bearable by eating basically one sweet treat per day. Yesterday, that treat was Big Gay Ice Cream. Big Gay Ice Cream is a magical ice cream shop. Their logo is a unicorn, sprinkles are always free, and they're constantly coming up with new and creative ways to do soft serve. Big Gay Ice Cream just celebrated their 10th anniversary and is rapidly expanding, which is especially exciting when you consider that the founders, Brian Petroff and Doug Quint, never intended for it to be more than a weird summer job. If I was asked to introduce myself, um, the thing that rings the most bells is the guy from Big Gay Ice Cream. That's Doug Quint. I mean, that's in a way that's sort of become my identity, which is fine. Um, yeah. And before that, you had a whole other life, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I moved to New York when I was 17 and um, started my bachelor's degree at Manhattan School of Music. And I played the bassoon. I mean, I, I started playing bassoon, I think, in eighth grade. And by the time I was in my junior year of high school, I thought, you know what? I'm not really good at anything except this. And I do have fun at it. So I'm going to really push. And um It turned out that I actually quit high school after my junior year and started college in Maine at University of Southern Maine. And then after that, Mm -hmm. I transferred to New York. I went to Manhattan School of Music and I got my bachelor's degree. After that, I went to Juilliard and I got my master's degree. And I just I freelanced and played in whatever orchestra would hire me on on bassoon and and did well at it. And uh, in (laughs) around 2007. I decided, you know, I got my master's degree. I'm really going to prove to myself that I can do this the whole way, and I'm going to get my doctorate and become Dr. Quint here. So I enrolled at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And in the late winter or so of 2009, I thought, you know, hopefully I'm going to pass my comprehensives this June. And assuming that's the case, I really want to do something this summer that has nothing to do with music. And you know, I, I needed a job, of course. I, 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 what that meant was I wasn't going to run around and play at summer festivals and you know, do all that. I wanted to stay in New York City. I wanted to have a New York City job experience. Mm-hmm. And that's how when the chance to have a, an ice cream truck came up, um, that's why I took it. I thought, well, it'll be a fun summer job. And the whole spirit of the thing was like, if, it, you know, if it's a giant colossal failure, that'll be a great story. And we're never right. going to do it again. We're never going to do it again after the summer. Anyhow, so let's just do it whatever the hell way we please. Right. So someone and, just had was like, does anyone want to drive an ice cream truck this summer? Um, How did that happen? It, that, it's more or less exactly that. Um, my friend Andrea Fisher, who was uh, at Juilliard while I was working there a bit, um, she was a real go-getter and always looking for interesting opportunities to you know, either further her career or make a buck. And (laughs) to that end, she, a few summers before, had somehow gotten an ice cream truck to drive, and she didn't buy it. So I found, she found a guy who had a couple of ice cream trucks at his disposal, and she got a vending badge and went out and became an ice cream person. So that, in uh, the beginning of 2009, when I went on this little job hunt, it sort of led me to her, and she had access to other ice cream trucks. And it didn't require any kind of investment. Um, really, we just 
signed out a truck for the day and went out and made some money and then had to give a cut to the guy who owned it. It was, it was a really, a comp- you know, a, a really, really easy and fair setup. You know? Right. And when you say that you had to, you knew you were going to brand it a little bit differently. Does that mean that you, were you planning of like, let's do something and call it big day ice cream truck or what did you think? Uh, so <laughs> I made a Facebook group and we had no idea what to call it. We just knew that we were going to have an ice cream truck. The two, the two things that we decided were, um, that we were going to sh- uh, spruce up the menu a little bit and that I was going to go out and be really, really super ridiculously happy because my vision of an ice cream man, since I didn't, there was not one around my little town in Maine as a kid, I always thought ice cream men should, or women should be the happiest person you ever see. So w- with that in mind, we, you know, we thought about the ice cream truck. We didn't, we wanted to set it apart somehow but we didn't want a vanity name for it. It wasn't going to be Doug's ice cream truck or anything like that. So in absence of any kind of name for the truck, I started a Facebook group for my friends to follow along with the whole thing. And I called it the big gay ice cream truck. (laughs) And it had not, we had no, we had no um, intention of that becoming a brand name or anything other than just a a goofy name for the Facebook group. The catch was that people started signing up for the group that I, we didn't know. Oh my so gosh. at that point, it, it was kind of too late. The brand name, the brand had uh, found its own name. And that's, <laughs> that's where Big Gay Ice Cream Truck came from. And what was that first summer like? Terrifying and weird. <laughs> it, <laughs> it was really strange to be, well, I mean, I, going into it, I knew it was going to be a, a bit of performance art. But I'd never realized how kind of daunting it would be to do this um, essentially on a stage in in New York City and really be uh, – it was just really, really daunting for those first few weeks to get up there and just I, – I, I love talking and I'll talk to anyone, but it was really – it was strange to feel like I was on – well, on stage, really – and sort of had to break the fourth wall and start talking to the audience. So it, it was it was a bit disconcerting at first, but pretty soon I snapped into this mode where that no longer mattered, and I was talking to everyone and getting regulars, and it all started to feel very natural to me. Um, the the shocking part was just how hard the work was. Mm. Um, you know, it it it's you know a nine or so hour shift or longer. Uh, on your feet the whole time in a vibrating, loud, you know, metal giant sardine can, essentially. And, you know, you know, there's no bathroom in there. There's not really any place to sit down when you're working hard. And by you know, two months in or so, I had a line waiting at the ice cream truck. So I would open up the window at about one o'clock. And around nine o'clock, I would start ask, telling people, please, I, please don't join the line. I need to close. So it was an entire summer of, you know, four or five hours of sleep, the hardest work ever. But it, it, it got to be where doing these long shifts were, it was just fine. I got up and I started and I kept going until I was ready to drop. And then I did it again the next day. It, it just felt so natural. Strangely enough, it felt like I found a, you know, a place where I was really comfortable. And I think the, the, the part of performing that I would have missed um, was filled by this gap where I was actually performing for people, you know, and no, I wasn't performing in an orchestra. I was performing in an ice cream truck, but it filled that same spot. Right. I mean, it, it clearly worked out because here we are. Um, and I'm wondering how you got from that first summer in a borrowed ice cream truck to where you are today well the jump from ice cream truck to store i mean it it, that first summer at union square it was just such a blast and i really got a lot of regulars and eventually got some notice from it and the second summer when we went out to do more or less the same thing rachel ray's people caught notice of us and once we were on the rachel ray show um, there was really no choice but to get uh, a shop going because uh, the day after we appeared on there, ev- everything quintupled. The lines got so long that, that regulars couldn't get to the truck. They would wave to me and say, you know, I got to get back. I can't, I can't wait. I got to get back to work. And we thought, well, we got to keep doing this, but we got to pl- have a place that regulars can get to us. So we found a little spot on East 7th Street and opened a shop. And, you know, there it just... It just built like a snowball. 
we, we ended up stopping the truck after the third summer um, it, for a couple of reasons, but really we just felt like, you know, let's not cling to this because the, the two years where the truck was full time, two and a half years were so, so magical and weird and, and irreplaceable and such great memories that I didn't want to keep doing it. I didn't, I sort of wanted to put it in the past and, and not sully it and just let it be, you know, the most, let that be the most, one of the most amazing things that will ever happen to me. It could only happen to New York. It could only happen during that recession. It could only happen because of a thousand different reasons. So let's just let it go. Right. Well, I'm thinking about, you know, kind of that, that moment with Good Morning America. And then also what you said about wanting to be kind of your childhood ideal of, of an ice cream truck. Um, and for me, you were definitely the first visibly queer business that I had access to as a young person, as a person that wasn't 21, you know, and yeah. couldn't go to a gay bar. Totally. But could go to big gay ice cream. And that, I think, I'm wondering if, if that was something you kind of anticipated or oh, were like, yes, no, no, this no, visible. No, no, no. no idea. Uh, and, and none of this was intentional, you remember? And we still, it's funny when we get people saying, you know, uh, that we did market research to identify like that there was a there was a, an unfilled niche for you know gay ice cream eaters or something like that and it, it's hilarious when people talk about us what that we formed to take advantage of this or that when in fact we formed just for the hell of it you know it, it, it just sort of we sort of brought something to, to light, I think, and it helped a lot of kids. There still are parents or, or uncles or whomever who will bring a kid to our shop and say that they want their first taste of ice cream to be from us, which is, of course, incredibly flattering, you know, and special. Um, but also, you know, when we did the truck, especially, I remember times when um, kids, there were, there were some parents who would bring their kids to the shop or to the truck and you know the kids were 14 or so and the parents I think had an inkling well, that the kid was probably gay or queer or whatever and they would bring them to the truck and buy them a cone and I could see the kid looking at me sort of like oh uh, you know I'm seeing a real live gay and it was really <laughs> it was really sort of a great thing that these parents were bringing their kid there just as a way for them as a way to help the kid crack the closet door open you know, and also one of the beautiful things that happened was occasionally a little cluster of kids would come up to the truck and one of them would start taunting me, um, you know, and ask me if I was a fag and stuff like that. And look, at this point, I'm standing on a stage in front of New York City and some you just try and shake me, you know. So I would say to the kid, like, yeah, but I, I, you're too young for me or whatever. And his, and his buddies would all go, ooh. But also, sometimes a kid would sort of taunt me, and his friends would shout him down and say, "Dude, shut up! He's there working. This is don't be don't be an idiot." So it sort of opened things up from various angles, you know. Just recently, someone on Instagram said we we brought our daughter to Big Gay Ice Cream to show how proud of, how proud we are of her now, and it turned out it was a trans kid, and they were bringing who now is their daughter to Big Gay Ice Cream to celebrate, you know, her becoming who she is supposed to be. And that, like, you know, still occasionally things blow my mind. And that's one of them. There's so many kids that used to come to the truck who were homeless and living on the piers. You know, their parents had thrown them out because they were they were trans. And here was a parent doing the exact opposite, celebrating it. And and to be any kind of part of that sort of transaction is is really beautiful. Uh. Yeah, that's so incredible. And I think, too, with the other side of like, even if you are <laughs> feeling like, oh, I, I hate gay people or I don't believe in this, it's very hard to hate ice cream. Yeah, <laughs> and that's part of the reason, uh, you know, people will say stuff online and other people will say it's just ice cream. How could you possibly take it so seriously? For the record, I take ice cream very seriously, but I understand what Doug was saying. After the break, I interview my ex-girlfriend, and spoiler alert, it's delightful. A 
This episode is brought to you by you. As an independent member supported nonprofit, the amazing content you hear on HRN is made possible thanks to our generous community of members and partners. For 10 years, HRN has been a defining voice in America's food movement, and we never would have made it this far without you. Join us in celebrating an amazing decade of food radio and support our summer fun drive by becoming a member of HRN. You can choose from our member gifts and will receive exclusive discounts on HRN events. We truly believe that with your help, we can change the world and our food system one bite or sound bite at a time. But there's no food radio without you. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate before July 31st to do your part to ensure a bright future for your favorite food podcasts. Hi, my name is Jesse. Uh, just to talk about, okay, let me start over. This is Jesse Nguyen. I'm the co-owner of Little Window, which is a Vietnamese spot in San Francisco. We do um, Vietnamese food inspired by my mom's homemade recipes. When I moved to the Bay back in 2013, I started hearing that there was this cool girl delivering delicious Vietnamese sandwiches all over San Francisco on her bicycle. It was actually first a bicycle pop-up called Bicycle Bun Me, and it was back in 2013. I was living in San Francisco, working a full-time job, doing statistics, and I think that there was something missing in my life, and I wanted uh, so much to learn about my mom's cooking, and also I wanted to be cooking a lot more, and so the idea of starting a pop-up kind of made sense. It was also during a time when I think that street food in San Francisco was growing in a really beautiful way. And so the idea of Vietnamese bun mi sandwiches delivered by bike was a crazy idea. And I just did it one day and it was so much fun. Weren't you just like on Twitter being like, does anyone want a sandwich? I'm delivering sandwiches. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it was totally, it was like before Instagram, but it was like, a small announcement that was like, oh, hey, we're going to be delivering sandwiches at the Panhandle or at Golden Gate Park or at Dolores Park tomorrow at two o'clock. And at that point, it was me and like trying to cook my mom's recipes. My mom on the phone with me being like, hey, like this is how you cook the lemongrass curry chicken. Yeah. What did your mom think when you call were calling her and being like, I'm making... <laughs> You know, 25 sandwiches to deliver in the park. <laughs> I think she loved it. I have three sis three other sisters. And so we had all moved away and like went off to school. And so food was this thing that like kept us coming back home. Growing up, my mom has always made the kitchen the center of our house. And I think growing up with that around me has definitely influenced like the way that I think about food and the way they think about how do I show someone that I love them or care about them and it's just like food is the easiest way to do that and it's so great to like watch her do that because I think oftentimes conversations and like the relationships I have with my parents can be like we're not always going to like talk about difficult things. They're not always going to be like, oh, so like, how are you? How's being queer? Like, how's coming out? You know, they're just going to be like, have you eaten yet? And so I think that moving away from home and kind of missing that aspect definitely was a big motivation of like starting Bicycle Bun Me because I have always wanted to learn how to cook my mom's recipes. And it's a really easy way for us to like have a conversation. And so I think processing it now, so much of my connection with food is just like understanding my relationship with my mom and my background and like filling in these gaps that I think I was seeking growing up. And I think that it then became this really wonderful opportunity for me to develop a relationship with my mom through food. And we both are like, passionate about it. And I'm curious about it. And like, we have, we have learned so much about each other al along the way. Not to say that it's not hard to be working with your mom. But I think in that space, it was, it was a good conduit for us getting to know each other and kind of like uplifting each other and, and encouraging each other to take th this risk. That risk was Jessie after a couple of years of making and delivering sandwiches after work or on the weekends, quitting her full-time job and along with Kim, her mom, focusing on Bicycle Bun Me full-time. 
also like not having any experience in food. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know like what was right or wrong. I was just like, oh, cool. Like this is happening. People are into it. Let's just try it out and see what happens. And so like along the way, my mom and I were just like, okay, cool. We're doing this. And we definitely like made so many mistakes that we've learned from. But I think that in just kind of going into it, in a way that was, it felt like genuine and it felt like an expression of ourselves that we were confident to share. And so I feel like a lot of opportunities came up through that. This is around the part where Jesse and I actually crossed paths. We met when she catered an event at my old job, became friends, and then eventually dated for a few months between 2015 and 2016. Around the same time, Bicycle Bun Me was becoming really popular. They got an offer to put in a bid for a small takeout window cafe in San Francisco, and they beat out a ton of other restaurants to get the spot. And then we had a month, basically, to open the window. It's a busy month (laughs) for you. (laughs) (laughs) But also, you were just, like, superheroing through it. Like, I remember on any given day being like, this is what I did today. What did you do today? And it was, like, enough things to fill four days. (laughs) How do you even open up a cafe? And I think that it was like transitioning from a pop-up to like opening a storefront. It felt like opening up a completely new business. This is the time period that I really wanted to talk with Jessie about. So much was happening in her life. In addition to opening Little Window and getting the hang of things there, she was in her first queer relationship and in the process of coming out. And I hadn't thought to ask about it at the time. But I reached out to her a few weeks before this interview, very nervous, but also intensely curious about what it was like for her to be going through those two big and tumultuous processes at once. Yeah, we were dating and you were coming out and or like had come out and we're in an evolving process of coming out and we're opening little window. And like looking back at that time, I wonder like, what was it like to be building a business and coming out at the same time? And I guess how did they overlap? And yeah, just what what do you observe around that? I'm so curious. Yeah, I guess like we were dating and I had just come out and I was just like acknowledging my queerness. And it was something that like I knew was always a part of me, but not yet ready to like come out. And then like at that same time, a little window opened. And I think that my idea around queerness was kind of always around like who I'm dating at the time. And what I wasn't yet aware of was that queerness comes out in so many different ways, especially like as like food, food that like connects people and brings community together in like a way that is nourishing. So upon acknowledging and going through the queer coming out journey, I was just like, oh, I want to create a space that allows me to be my queer self or the queer person that I want to be, which is feeling safe to just talk about certain things or feeling comfortable enough to talk about my struggles. And I think that in the past, When I was working at my other full-time job, I feel like I didn't have that. It was like there was such a stark separation between my business persona and then my personal persona. And so I feel like initially I came into Little Window thinking that there needed to be the separation of my business Little Window life and then my personal queer journey. Yeah, totally. I'm thinking of the time when we went to a party, like a (laughs) queer party and ran into someone that was had maybe had been one of your employees and you were just like shit shit shit." (laughs) oh my gosh I I do remember when that happened I was just like wait no this is so weird but now I'm just like no like I want my queer community to overlap in all the ways that I want to express myself and then I guess through growing the team and like hiring we were really lucky to have some amazing queer folks join Little Window as Little Window was starting But we also, like, while Little Window was evolving, I was also overcoming, like, the stigma I had around queerness and, like, also maybe feeling, like, levels of shame around it and not yet being ready to be so proud, you know? And, like, in a way that was unintentional, but I'm so glad it happened. Little Window became my queer safe space. Do you remember moments of feeling like you were able to kind of soften into that? Or what was that process? Little Window is, like, really small, and so... Every day there's maybe like four people working there. And so it's such a tight knit crew. And 
in the first year of Little Window, there were like two or three queer people working there and going into work every day, spending like eight to nine hours with these people and just like feeling like, oh, I love the way that I feel right now. Like spending time around queer people for most of my day is such a gift because it like allows us to have these conversations that I wouldn't have in a straight workplace. I love hearing that. I also think so often it's like, I don't know, there's a, there's only this like one narrative that exists of someone like going to work for a boss that is queer. And so for you to be like, yeah, I was in charge, but also my employees created this space for me, I think is so special. Oh, I think that also is the idea of like queerness was something that I was learning to become comfortable with, but also like it is such like a big umbrella term that like I never knew what it really meant to be like queer. And so there was just a lot of feelings initially of just like, am I queer enough? Or like, am I dot, dot, dot enough? You know, like fill in the blank. And so I think that what, what was nice is just getting to see different kinds of queerness and like for them, even like at Little One, being like, oh, like you're queer, like that's, that's great. Like, and that, like, and that was enough, you know, and not having to like, feel like I needed to prove myself in any other way. Do you remember when you first started publicly talking about Little Window being a queer run business? I mean, I feel like we always did events that were um, like around Pride that were celebrating Pride. But I think like intentionally it was when the collaboration with Queer Soup Night in Oakland came up that I was like, hey... I'm a queer business owner and we're doing this because we believe in this cause and Queer Soup Night is this like beautiful event that allows us to celebrate food and queerness in a way that's like so nourishing. Did that change anything? Did other people's reactions have other people's reactions to you change like positively or negatively or? I think just doing something like that like publicly was its own like coming out for me. So like it was this like personal achievement of being like, oh, cool. Like I'm so glad that I finally have a way to overlap my food community, which I feel like always has had its own identity of being like, oh, we're a small Vietnamese like mother daughter owned business. And that has always kind of been the narrative of Bicycle Bun Me and like it's evolved into Little Window. And then coming out in that way of like, hey, we're intentionally doing this event because we're a queer owned business. It felt almost kind of like this relief of like, I'm so glad that two parts of my identity are coming together now. With those two narratives kind of now both existing, how have your conversations with your mom been around it? Oh, uh, like, oh, that's a good question. Um, conversations with my mom around queerness, definitely in the past like year or two have been a lot more present, I think, because I'm finally feeling like I'm in a place where it's like important that I communicate that to her. And maybe before that, when I was just recently coming out, I was just like, okay, cool. Like I came out to her, I'm good. You know, and like, I didn't really need more conversation than that. And that might've just been like a cultural thing. We're like, okay, cool. We don't really talk about who we date and we don't really talk about our love lives because all they really care about is like, whether I'm financially like sustainable and like taking care of myself in those ways but it's been more and more important to me to have that conversation with my mom and even just saying the word queer in front of her and having more opportunities to say that in front of her makes her feel comfortable and so I mean it was like a really big thing earlier this year when she was like acknowledging my queerness and saying queer um that felt really special but it's just been kind of like baby steps and I think that through doing certain queer events and being more intentional about that, I think it's given her space to be like, hey, I support you in like all these ways. And like, you can be whoever you want to be. And that's okay with me. And she said that to me earlier this year. And it felt like, whoa, like I've never had that kind of conversation with my mom before. Uh, I'm just like so thrilled for you. This has been so nice to just hear you talk about like all of these things that are... Yeah. I don't know, like in ways that oh my God. in ways that we're still yeah. unsettled. Totally. And it's like I think that that's the thing with queerness is that it's constantly evolving. And like 
there are so many different ways in which it can overlap and like finding those different communities that allow me to like express different parts of my identity and understand parts of my identity have been so helpful and like healing, you know, and having those things come together and like having the words to describe those feelings has made me feel that little window is like becoming its own thing that is a true reflection of us. Like I said, a delightful conversation with my ex. If you're ever in San Francisco, I would 100% recommend checking out Little Window. They're tucked away in a really sweet corner of the North Beach neighborhood. And for folks on the East Coast, you can visit a big gay ice cream shop in New York or Philadelphia. That is our show for today. We'll be back in two weeks. Credits time. Queer the Table is produced by me, Nico Whistler. Our logo was designed by Natalie Uduwella, and the theme song is by Denali Gillespie, who also inspired the name for the show. None of this would be possible without the support of the whole team at HRN. The Summer Fun Drive is still happening, and we still very much need your support. You can become a member today by going to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate right now. Lead me in the kitchen What are we going to make? What do you crave? Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.